Well, good morning. Good morning. You know, several years ago, my buddy Mark Middleberg and I were doing a series of seminars in Australia. So we were touring around the country, Brisbane, Sydney, and doing these seminars. We came to our last night, and it was in Melbourne. So we come to Melbourne, we do the seminar, we're all done, we're going to fly home the next day, so we're driving toward the hotel, and we came to a fork in the road. One fork would have taken us right to the hotel, and that would have been the simple thing to do, go back to the hotel, get a quick meal, get to bed, because we're going to fly home early the next morning. But the other fork led toward this kind of sketchy area of town, but they had great restaurants. So you can guess which fork won. We're dry. We decided, well, let's go for the, yeah, it's a little, day, a little sketchy. We're going to go to the great restaurant area. So we take that fork in the road. We park the car. We lock it up. We go into this restaurant. We have a great meal, Australian meal. It sounds kind of, you know, oxymoronish. But um, we, we, uh, at the end, we walk out, and our car had been stolen. Everything, all our luggage, everything, and the whole car, it was gone. I remember we went to the police station. We're reporting this theft, and I said to the guy at the desk, I said, hey, shouldn't be hard to find it. He said, why? I said, this is an island. It's on the island somewhere, right? How hard can it be? He didn't find that funny. He said, you know, Australia is 11 times bigger than Texas. Were you aware of that? But anyway, uh, it, it was a, a big hassle in terms of our travel to lose all our stuff, to lose the car. But you know what? The insurance took care of the car. And actually, our homeowner's insurance took care of all of our um, uh, belongings that were stolen. So in the end, it was an inconvenience, but it wasn't that big of a deal. But... There are times in life where we face a spiritual fork in the road. And the consequences of taking the wrong fork in that road, that can be eternal. That can be a big problem. We see this fork in the road over and over again in the Bible. For instance, when Jesus was riding a donkey into Jerusalem in the final days of his earthly mission, and the crowds that greeted him were facing a fork in the road. Should they follow him or should they not? Should they honor him or should they not? Should they hail him as the king or should they denounce him as an imposter? Well, some chose to follow Jesus' fork in the road, to follow Jesus' path. Luke 19, verses 37 and 38 say this. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles that they had seen. They said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They chose the fork in the road that heads to heaven. But others who had seen those same miracles decided to take a different fork, decided to take the other road, decided to take their own dead-end road. John 12, verse 37 says, Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Luke's gospel tells us, As Jesus came closer to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. He said, how I wish today that you, of all people, would understand the way to peace, the road that leads to peace, the fork that leads to eternal life. Jesus was weeping because of what might have been. He had come with astounding miracles. He had come with breathtaking teaching. He had come in fulfillment of the ancient prophecies of the coming Messiah. And yet, when it came time to face the fork in the road, some people, instead of taking the road to eternal life, took the road that was a spiritual dead end. And Jesus knew what the consequences would be, and so he wept. Jesus wept because, as he said in Luke 19, verse 44, you did not recognize it when God visited you. So here's the question I want to ask today. Has God ever visited you? Have you ever had an experience where you felt the presence of God that he was visiting you? And if so, how did you respond? Because every time God visits us, there's a fork in the road. Which fork in the road did you take? Did you take his or did you take your own? 
Granted, he may not come as tangibly as a, you know, riding in on a donkey, but sometime in your life, I bet you felt God visiting you, that God sort of tapping you on the shoulder, God uh, kind of being so close to you, you could almost feel his breath on your neck. Times when you felt spiritually open, times when you felt drawn to God, times when you felt attracted to his kingdom. I bet God has visited you in one way or the other. How did you respond? Because every visitation from God brings a fork in the road. So here's what I want to do today. I want to describe four scenes from my own life when I feel, when I was an atheist, when I was a skeptic, when I was not a Christian, even then how God visited me and describe what happened, because I'm hoping it will spark some thinking in your own life to maybe help you remember moments when God may have visited you, when he may have been calling out to you, because guess what? It's not too late to take a detour and get back on God's path. So maybe even through this message today, you'll feel God visiting you. And if you do, keep in mind Hebrews 3, verse 15, that says, today... If you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. So let's talk about four of the many ways that God tends to visit people. First way is this. Sometimes God visits us when we glimpse the brevity of life. When we glimpse the brevity of life. And the scene from my own life took place, again, when I was far from God, took place in 1979 in northern Indiana. I was writing a book about the Ford Pinto case. Many of you are too young to remember this, but uh, the Ford Pinto is a car manufactured by Ford. It was uh, poorly designed, and as a result of this poor design of this car, it had a, a horrible tendency to explode in a fireball when hit from behind in low or moderate speed crashes. Many people burned to death in Ford Pinto Uh, explosions. And I was writing a book about this. I was investigating an accident in which a Chevy van rear-ended a Pinto. It sparked a fireball that burned two teenage girls to death. And it left the 18-year-old driver of the car, a girl named Judy, with burns over 95% of her body. It was a horrendous accident. They found Judy at the scene. She was barely clinging to life with 95% of her body burned. And they took her to the hospital, and at the hospital they realized there's nothing they could do to save her. And so they decided to take her by ambulance to a burn center about an hour away where they could tend to her in the final moments of her life. And so for my book, I was interviewing the nurse who rode in the ambulance with Judy on the way to the burn center. So you can imagine how difficult a trip this would be. Judy wasn't in a lot of physical pain because the the, the fire had actually burned away her nerve endings. But she was in great emotional pain. She was separated from her family. She was separated from her friends. She knew she was in the final moments of her life. She was racked by anxiety and fear. And I asked the nurse, what did you say to what, what did you find to say to her? What, what, what could you say to try to ease her fear and calm her anxieties? And the nurse said, it started out as a nightmare. Nothing, she said, that I could communicate to Judy would ease her fear or take away the anxiety until Judy mentioned something about Jesus. And that's when the nurse realized that Judy was a Christian just like the nurse was. And then the nurse knew what to do. With tears running down her cheeks, she recited a passage from Scripture that proved to be the only medication that could ease the anxiety and chase away the fears of Judy. The words were from Isaiah 43, where it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And as she heard those words, Judy slowly began to take on a calmness and a courage that she didn't have before. Because she she was reminded that she belonged to God. And that in an ultimate sense, not even fire could destroy what is his. 
And she began to relax in the knowledge that God would not abandon her, that he would be with her in these final moments of her life, and that when she passed into eternity, he would hold her tight in his embrace forever. And as the nurse told me this story, again, I'm an atheist at the time, and the nurse is telling me this story, and tears welled up in my eyes. Because suddenly, something inside of me longed for that kind of security and and confidence and peace and courage. I mean, her story was a stark reminder to me that for all of us, our life is short. And that for all of us, at some point, we will look over the precipice at death. And in a way, I felt God reaching out to me at that moment. And maybe you have too. Maybe you've gone to the funeral of a loved one. And you've glimpsed the brevity of life and you felt God's very presence right there. Or maybe you sat at the bedside of someone who was critically ill. Or maybe you've gotten bad medical uh, information uh, reports in your own life. Sometimes in the midst of those anxieties and those fears, God visits us. But you know what I did? I took the other fork. I took the other fork. I think like a lot of people, I thought, you know what? It's a long way from my own demise. I've got a long life to live. I don't have to worry about this now. I can think about this kind of stuff later. And I didn't take the path of Jesus. I took the path of Lee. And I walked the other way. And that wasn't the only time when I was a non-Christian that I felt a visitation from God. Because, you see, sometimes God also visits us in the depths of a personal crisis. You see, when our daughter was born in 1976, Allison, everything was fine for the first few hours. But then the next early morning, we were waiting for the doctors and nurses to bring in the baby for feeding. Leslie's there in the hospital room, and they didn't come. And we waited and waited and waited, and I went out to find out what was going on, and as I did... I was met by a line of doctors and specialists looking very glum. And they walked into our room and they said, you need to sit down. We have very bad news. Your daughter is very ill. We've transferred her to the neonatal intensive care unit. We need your signature on these forms to you know, authorize a bunch of tests. We don't know what's wrong. We just know it's very, very serious. And you need to prepare for the worst. Well, you know, they say there are no atheists in foxholes. I will tell you what, there aren't a lot of atheists in neonatal intensive care units either. Because you know what I did? I prayed. I prayed. I said, God, I don't believe you're there. In fact, I'm convinced you're not. But if you are, heal my daughter. Do something. Take care of my daughter. And if you do, I will do whatever you want. I made that kind of promise to God. Have you ever faced a frantic situation like that where you made a promise to God? Maybe your career imploded. Maybe your spouse walked out for the last time. Maybe your child's gotten arrested or or is wandering or is in trouble in some way and you don't know what to do. Or you're facing bankruptcy. Or you've got a looming illness in your life. I don't know what it is, but have you ever had one of those panicky situations where you have called out to God and you felt that he was there. You felt like he's going to help you. He's going to take care of you. That that there is hope. That there there is another path. And you sensed his presence in the midst of that crisis. Have you ever had that happen? I did. I did. Well, after a few days in the neonatal intensive care unit with all these monitors and tubes and everything hooked up to, to Allison, the doctors came in about a week later, and they said, hey, we don't know what happened. We never were able to diagnose what was wrong with her, but she's fine. All of a sudden, she's okay. You can take her home. She's fully healed. Now, some people would have said, oh, my goodness, is that a miracle? You know what I said? Oh, my goodness, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. Isn't it great that the doctors are so amazing? They can cure our daughter, even though they never knew what it was that she had. And I went back to my life. I was faced with a fork in the road. And God, I think by that miraculous healing of my daughter, was calling me toward his kingdom, and I walked the other path. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because of pride. Maybe it's because of self-sufficiency. I don't know. But I walked 
the other path, and I forgot about all the promises that I made. Have you ever done that? You ever made promises to God? I need your help. If you come through for me, I'll do, I'll do whatever for you, and you, you, you go back to life, and you forget about all that stuff. I mean, I was like those people in John 12, 37. Even after Jesus had done so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him, and I wouldn't either. The third scene was not long after that illness, and it illustrates another way that God sometimes visits us. See, sometimes God visits us at the point of our deepest longing, the point of our deepest longing. I was a journalist at the Chicago Tribune at the time, and I was working on an article, and I had to find an old article I'd written a few years earlier. So I went into what they call the morgue. Uh, At a newspaper, the library, where they keep all the clips of all the old articles, it's called the morgue. And I don't know why they call it the morgue. It's not a a good term to call it. I remember we had a summer intern at the newspaper, and she was from rural Indiana. And her mother was so scared that she was going to be living in Chicago, big city. She was afraid for what might happen to her daughter. She would call every day to find out if her daughter was okay. So one day, her daughter uh, was in the library at the newspaper checking something, and her mother calls, and somebody else answered the phone, and her mother said, is my daughter there? And they said, oh, I'm sorry, she's in the morgue. (laughs) And her mother said, I knew it. I knew we shouldn't let her go to Chicago. (laughs) So I don't know why they call it the morgue, but they do. So I went into the morgue to find this old article, and, and and I couldn't find the clip, and the librarian said to me, look, I don't know if you know this, but we keep a record. We keep a file drawer of, full of every article that you've ever written. Every reporter at the paper has their own drawer. And so she takes me over to it, and she pulls open this drawer. And sure enough, inside, just packed are these, all these yellow envelopes and neatly folded inside every one was an article I'd written for the newspaper. And I, she opened that drawer, and I looked at that entire representation of my professional life. And you know what my reaction was? I'm getting ripped off. I'm getting ripped off. I'm spending 60 to 70 hours a week for what? For a bunch of articles that are turning yellow and brittle and falling apart? Is this what I'm trading my life for? Have you ever felt that? Because at that moment, I felt like God was saying to me, I've got something better for you. I've got something more important for you. I have something eternal for you. You ever felt like you're trading your life for a wall full of plaques? You're trading your life for a bag full of shopping receipts. You're trading your one and only life for a bunch of notches on a bedpost. You're trading your one and only life for a bunch of empty bottles. You're trading your one and only life for a portfolio full of stocks. Do you ever feel like you're getting ripped off? Have you ever feel God saying to you, there's more for you? Not that he calls all of us to be full-time missionaries, but for all of us, there's an eternal purpose. There's an eternal mission. There's something greater than ourselves. And at that moment, There was something inside of me that said, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a journalist. It's an honorable profession. But there's got to be more than this. There's got to be someone greater than this with whom I could connect. There's got to be something that my life stands for that is eternal, that makes a difference forever. And I felt God in that moment calling out to me. And you know what I did? I took the other path. I took the other path once more. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was pride. I don't know. But I decided I'm going to walk my own way. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make a difference through these brittle, yellowed articles. That is going to be the legacy of my life. And I walked away. Have you ever walked away when you sensed that God was calling you to something greater and eternal in your life? I did. And then there's the fourth scene from my life. And that happened when I was a reporter at the Chicago Tribune. And I was assigned to write a series of articles 
on the poorest people of Chicago. And this experience taught me this. Sometimes God visits us in the Jesus that we see in others. So I began researching this article, profiling these families that are destitute, and that's how I met the Delgado family. The Delgado family consisted of the grandmother, Perfecta, who was 60 years old, crippled by arthritis, and she by herself was raising two granddaughters, 11-year-old Lydia and 13-year-old Jenny, and they were among the poorest families I ever encountered. They, lived, they, they had lived in, a, in this roach-filled apartment on the west side of Chicago. That burned down. So now they were in this tiny, tiny little two-bedroom tenement on West Homer Street in Chicago. And as I walked into their place, I couldn't believe how absolutely empty it was. I was just struck. There's nothing in these two rooms. I mean, there were no appliances in the kitchen, no rugs in the wall, no furniture, no pictures on the walls. There was nothing except a little card table in the kitchen and one cup of rice. That was it. In fact, Lydia and Jenny only owned one short sleeve dress each. And between them, they owned one thin gray sweater. And so when they walked the half mile to school through the biting Chicago winters, Lydia would wear the sweater halfway to school while her sister would shiver beside her and then she would take off the sweater and give it to her sister to wear the rest of the way. And yet, here was the amazing thing I discovered about the Delcados. Despite their poverty, they had an enduring faith in Jesus Christ. They had faith that God had not abandoned them. They had faith that God was going to come through for them. They had faith that, that there was hope in the midst of this situation that others would have seen as absolutely hopeless. And because of this vibrant relationship they had with God, it was as if they had everything. And so in talking to them, I began to feel this great irony that here are these people who had nothing but faith and they seemed happy. And I had everything I needed materially, and I lacked faith, and my soul felt as barren as their two-room apartment. Well, so I wrote an article, it came out on Thanksgiving that year, about the Delgado family, and I put their address purposely in the article. And then I moved on to other stories, and, but I couldn't get the Delgados out of my mind. And so on Christmas Eve, I'm there in the newsroom at the Tribune, nothing was going on, it's snowing outside. And I thought, I want to go visit the Delgados once more and see how they're doing. So I get in the car. I drive out to West Homer Street. They open the door to their place, and it looked like Nordstrom's inside. <laughs> the readers of the Tribune responded to the article by sending everything. It, their place was just overflowing with stuff. They sent appliances and furniture and rugs and pictures for the wall and a Christmas tree. It was overflowing with gifts. They opened the closet, and it was just packed with warm winter coats and scarves and gloves, and there was food coming out from all of the, the cabinets in the kitchen, and they had thousands of dollars that people had donated cash to them. But guess what? Guess what I interrupted when I walked into their apartment? Lydia and Jenny and Perfecta had these cardboard boxes and they were packing up most of these new belongings to give away. To give away. And this blew me away. This blew me away. I said, well, what are you doing? Why are you giving this stuff away? And Perfecta looked at me and she said, Lee, our neighbors are still in need. We cannot have plenty while they have nothing. I mean, this blew me away because I would have been hoarding this stuff. I would have been selling it on eBay or something. <laughs> so when I asked for her reaction, I said, what do you think of the generosity of the readers of the Tribune that donated all this stuff to you? She said, oh, this is wonderful. This is terrific. We did nothing to deserve this. It is a gift of God. But, she said, it is not his greatest gift. No, Lee. It's not his greatest gift. His greatest gift we remember tomorrow. His greatest gift is Jesus. I mean, to her, this child in the manger meant everything. That was the undeserved gift. 
that made all the difference in her life more than the material possessions, more than comfort, more than food. And at that moment, I wanted to know this Jesus. Something in me, in seeing Jesus in Perfecta and her granddaughters, told me I need to know this Jesus. Because they had peace despite their poverty, while all I had was anxiety despite my plenty. And they knew the joy of generosity when all I knew was the loneliness of ambition. They looked heavenward while I only looked out for myself. They experienced the wonder of the spiritual world while I was shackled to the shallowness of the material world. And something in me at that moment said, I want to know what they... No, I'm not. I want to know not what they know. I want to know who they know. And God, at that moment, was visiting me. Have you ever seen that in someone else? The presence of God, the courage of God, the confidence that God has put in someone's life despite difficult circumstances? Have you ever encountered someone like that and it drew you toward God? It made you want to know him? Well, the Delgados haunted me all that holiday season, but guess what? I got other assignments. I got other responsibilities. I went back to work as normal, and faced with that spiritual fork in the road, once more, I took my own path, and I said no to God. So those are four scenes from my own life when I felt receptive to God and ended up saying no. And I'll tell you what, if I could go back to any one of those instances, I would have made the opposite decision today, knowing what I know now, in a flash, I would have taken God's path, but I didn't do it. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, Lee, you know, someday, someday I'm going to take that path. You know, I've had instances like you've talked about, where I felt the presence of God, where I felt his breath on my neck, And I took my path. But you know, someday, someday, I'm going to take his fork. Can I tell you why you shouldn't delay? First of all, you don't know how many days you have in this world. I was just talking last night to Dave Marks, guy here on the staff that that does all the the staging uh, here uh, for our services. And he got the flu, and uh, it attacked his heart. He almost died. He had to have heart surgery to save his life. They said, you should have been dead. Just from the flu. We just don't know how many days God has given us. There was a story where Jesus uh, was describing the life of a successful farmer who was making all kinds of ambitious plans for the future. But what the farmer didn't know is that that day was his last in this world. So don't assume there will always be another visitation. You know, the more we harden our hearts every time and take our own path, Sometimes it makes it harder to recognize these visitations from God. And the other thing is, think of all the irreplaceable time that you're going to miss, that you could have been relating to the God of the universe, but no, you've delayed it to some time in the future. You know, my friend, uh, Evil Knievel, the great motorcycle daredevil rider, who came to a radical conversion in Jesus Christ in the later years of his life, and I'll never forget talking to him after he came to faith, And here he was in his 60s, and his biggest lament, and he said to me this over and over, Lee, if I'd only come to faith as a child, if I'd only come to faith as a kid, if I'd only received Christ years ago, I could have lived for him. My life could have been different. It could have been so different. I could have have followed him. I could have told others about him. I could have had an eternal purpose in my life. And he lamented that. The biggest regret of his life was he didn't come to faith until his final years. And he ended up dying just a couple of years after he came to faith. And on his tombstone it says, believe in Jesus. But his biggest lament is, I could have done this when God visited me 50 years ago and how my life would have been different. Not only that, but think about this. When you put off receiving Christ, when you put off taking his path, think of all the sin that you're going to commit in your life that's going to hurt you and hurt your family and hurt other people because you're following your ways. Think of all that sin that now would not be committed 
if you made the decision today to take the path of Jesus Christ. Not that you're going to live the perfect life, but the fact that your, your values, your character, your morality, your worldview, your attitude, your philosophy, your, all of this is going to change over time. And a lot of the sins that you would have committed if you'd stayed on your own path, you're not going to commit. What a great benefit of this. Why would you want to wait? James 5.20 said, He who turns a sinner from the error of his ways saves his soul from death and covers a multitude of sin. Think of all the sin you could avoid if you come to faith when God visits you today. I am so thankful that on November the 8th of 1981, God visited me once more. And it was in the midst of finishing a two-year investigation that I did into the historical evidence for Jesus Christ. And as God visited me, I realized that the evidence of history shows indisputably to me that God, Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. And God visited me at that moment, and I faced the fork in the road, and this time I said, I'm going to take the fork of Jesus Christ. And I have never looked back. I have never looked back. It has been the greatest adventure I've ever been on in my life. But what about you? What about you? Have you taken that fork? It, 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 maybe God, even today, is visiting you. Maybe he's visiting you, and you can almost feel his breath on your neck, and you're facing a fork in the road today. Hebrews would tell you, do not harden your heart. Or maybe he's calling you, uh, you know, there's a fork in the road, but it's a fork of deeper commitment, deeper obedience. Maybe there's some step that you know God wants you to take of deeper obedience, further travel down his road. Maybe it's to be baptized. Maybe you've never been baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. And you know that's what God would want you to do. Or maybe it's a a pattern of giving or serving or going on a mission trip or whatever it is that God's been, been, been calling out to you and visiting you about. Maybe you need to go further down that road. I don't know what path God is calling you on today. But I want to tell you this. If you don't personally know Jesus Christ, if you don't have 100% confidence that if you close your eyes for the last time in this world, you will open them in the presence of God for eternity, if you don't have that total confidence today, you can have it. You can make the decision. The fork is in the road. Let's decide that choice right now. Let's decide to go the road of Jesus Christ. So let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you want to take that step, if you want to say yes to taking the spiritual fork in the road to follow Jesus Christ, then in your heart, God will hear you. Just in your heart, say, Lord Jesus, I want to take your road forever. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I want to turn from that. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased for me on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. Help me by the work of your Holy Spirit to faithfully walk your path from this moment on. Because from this moment on, I am yours. Now, Father, we thank you for your relentless and your reckless love. I think of the song, is so powerful, sung earlier in this service, that you leave behind the 99 and you go after each one of us and you visit us and you beckon to us. Thank you that you love us that much. Thank you for those that have chosen to take your path. And Father, for those that are wrestling with some other um, aspect of obedience that you want them to follow, we pray even in this moment they would purpose to say yes to whatever it is you want them to do. Thank you that you are a God who loves us, who provides for us, who opens the door of heaven to us. And all God's people said, Amen.